keep her in your prayers. I know it's going to be a stressful and emotional time for her. Uh, Dad's 80 years old, so hold him up in prayer if you would. Enough time uh, for them, okay? But uh, this morning, let's go ahead and get our minds toward the Lord and towards His Word. And uh, let's begin the service, all right? Brother Del Webb, would you ask the blessing on the meeting for us, please? Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your love and mercy and yes. your support us. We thank you, Lord, that we know that salvation comes through Jesus Christ in your moment. We ask you to bless today in the preaching word of God and the singing and the fellowship and the worship. Lord, that your will might be done in your spirit. I have lived to be the word to be, oh Lord, I wish you can. Help us, Lord, in the day and hour that we live. Lord, we realize that time is short. Opportunities are running out. Help us to be faithful in the things of God. For our sake and our sake, we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning. Let's stand together and start with number 514 today. 514, we're marching to Zion.
fellows come forth, we'll go ahead and get ready to give the Lord an offering this morning. In your bulletin, there is no announcements, but uh, uh, there uh, is something I'd like for you to pray about with me. It's a date. Uh, Brother Gary and I have been talking. I would really uh, like the Lord's leading on this. Between him and I, we've been talking about him preaching a few nights there as we're heading back to school. And just have a back to school meeting and uh, and really make an evangelistic approach to it. Of course, Brother Gary, uh, you know, he's veteran and uh, he's, in my book, he's a preacher's preacher. And I just Amen. love him. And, uh, he always has liberty to preach whatever, but I would like for you and I to work together to try to get out there and lost relatives, lost neighbors. Amen. Everybody you know needs to hear the gospel. We just get out there and work to try to bring them in uh, to that meeting. And right now we're discussing some dates and looking at them, praying for them. I want you to pray about it with us, if you would, please. And let's, uh, let's ask the Lord's blessing on that meeting, all right? Uh, birthdays this week is Sister Hattie Foster, still praying for her and her health. Uh, Brother Ben Henson has a birthday this week. Thank the Lord for him. Uh, Darlene Bertram, Ashley Armstrong, Brother Doyle Smith, uh, Sonia Massey, amen. Andrea Bolin, praise the Lord, amen. The, everybody's getting older, amen. We're getting wiser now. <laughs> Rachel Henry, Gideon Ellis, and then anniversaries this week, Brother David and Sister Margarita Gillum. Thank God for them. They, you don't hardly get to see them anymore. They hang out up there. He's always making faces at me while I'm preaching. They say, no, you're wrong, you're wrong. But <laughs> he tries to help me, but I appreciate him, amen. All right, let's ask the Lord's blessing on the offering then. If you're visiting with us, we pass two plates. The reason is because the gold plate is for missions and the other plate deals here with our tithes and offerings, okay? Brother Tim, could we get you to pray for us, please? Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, come down for you this morning. Lord God, just thank you for your blessing upon us. Thank you, Lord God, for this church, Lord God, for members of us, Lord Jesus. Just pray, Lord God, and be with us, Lord God. Lord God, just thank you, Lord God, for your precious.
Amen. Samuel chapter 22. Second Samuel chapter 22. And this is the 22nd message here on Sunday mornings pertaining to David, a man after God's own heart. As we've been going along here looking at truths concerning David's life and seeking to make application, of course, to our own life. And uh, trying to learn by and learn from the merits and even the mistakes that David has made. And uh, for that reason, it has all been recorded for us. Uh, Paul the Apostle mentions this over in the book of Romans, chapter 15. He says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, 
were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. And uh, Paul was saying there that the record of the Old Testament is given to us. Uh, they are God-given examples for us to learn by. And God uses them to uh, illustrate truths to us. And that also is mentioned uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So in David's life, there's a lot to learn by and a lot to learn from, both good and bad. And the matter of David's life, if you'll remember the record of it, begins to come into focus as there had been a man named Saul that was anointed to be king and uh, was proving to be very unstable. In his heart, his character, he was self-centered and a man beyond reproof, couldn't be helped. Uh, he wasn't fit for government because he wasn't one to be governed. Uh, turns out very hot-headed, out of control, and as that began to come to the surface, uh, in time, it was only going to prove to get worse, and it did. Uh, the more that Saul didn't get his way there, uh, you could see that he was growing in frustration, and it becomes clear as to really what he's full of, what his heart is all about, what's making him tick. And upon his disobedience to the Lord's command, uh, God at that moment refused him and determined that he was not going to bless his seed after him. And the Lord said, I'm seeking now a man that's better than you, I'm looking for someone who's after my own heart. And so God began a search, and there in Bethlehem, Judah, the younger son of Jesse, of the house of Jesse there, uh, though he was not choice among men, uh, he was not choice, uh, amen, even among his own family, he was choice to God, and as a young man named David. And he was choice because of the condition of his heart. Uh, he had set his heart on the Lord at an early age, and the condition of the heart was so important that even though there was already a king on the throne who had already been anointed, yet uh, God would determine that this young man, at, even at his age, would be anointed as king over all Israel and he would be Saul's replacement. So uh, David, as you've seen there getting to the throne, he proves to be of an outstanding character and heart. He's been proven uh, by many a trial and temptation, proven by challenges and opportunities even options that he had, obligations uh, that he, he felt that he needed to be faithful to. And his heart was an outstanding example uh, for us to look to and for us to learn from. And we see in David a man who could be governed. He was someone who was fit to lead because we saw before he ever got to the throne, he was one who was not above following. Uh, he was somebody who had that spiritual quality of submission and subjection to him for all authority, and even though we saw him pressed out of measure and problems and things that regarded uh, selfish pride, even in David's heart, uh, matters of forgiveness, uh, matters of being patient, in all those areas, God was giving his heart a checkup, and David checked out. And uh, at that time that David would ascend to the throne there, God, we seen, is still working on his heart. Because the goal wasn't just to get David to the throne. The goal was to get a man after God's own heart on the throne. And once David gets to the throne, God doesn't give up on his heart. God continues to work on his heart and keep it in check. And we saw many instances in that scenario where David gives to us, used by the Spirit of God, a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a glorious thing that he in his life, in his position, in his character, in his actions, could testify of the glories of Jesus Christ. But then, sadly, as men go... And David was still just a man following several moments of triumph. Amen? It's good to have mountaintop experiences, but you better watch what's coming later. He had mountaintop experiences in the context of being busy, growing weary, in the context of being disrespected, even by his wife when he brought home uh, the ark. Uh, he was dishonored by the people of Ammon uh, while another war was breaking out despite his intentions to try to keep it from happening, in that context, David gave in to the temptation to sin. And it wasn't the first sin he ever committed, obviously, there, but it was a terrible sin. And it was such a terrible sin that it troubled the house of a fellow soldier. It disrupted his fellowship with God. Uh, it went on to trouble his own house for years to come. And it gave the enemies of God an occasion to blaspheme. But David repented. <laughs> David got right with God. Amen. 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 Some people talk about what well, the sin David committed, but he got right with God. Amen. Don't quit reading when he messed up. Amen. He responded. A preacher came to him and said, Thou art the man. He didn't argue with him. 
He didn't justify himself. He said, you're right, I'm the man. I've sinned against the Lord. And he knew there wasn't a sin offering or a burnt offering. There was no kind of offering in that Old Testament system that he could offer up to provide atonement for the sin he had been guilty of. So we know from other Scripture what David's approach was. He wasn't willing just to say, well, that's all there is. I've messed up now. I'll just go down this road of having messed up. No, he wasn't going to let go of that relationship he had with God. We know from Psalm 51, he prayed, he said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. He said, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. He said, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou might be clear, uh, that thou might be justified when thou speakest to me, clear when thou judgest. You know what he was saying? Over there in the book of Job, there he talks about the Lord says, Wilt thou condemn me that thou mayest be righteous? You know, a lot of people, that's their approach when they've done wrong. Amen. Find something wrong with God, find something wrong with the Bible. But, but Job, you know what you know what Job said? I, I, I'm not going to do that. He ended up getting right. Here David, he says, My sin, I've sinned against you. It's always before me that thou mayest be clear when thou speakest. And he says, Behold, I was shaken in iniquity, and sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. And he prays, Purge me. Praise to God. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Here, here he realized things have changed. He said, make me to hear joy and gladness. Amen. That the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. This is what he prayed. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. And again, David got right with God. He got right with God all those years prior to getting away from the Lord there where there had been a heart before that had been right with God. There had been fellowship with God there. He was subject to the workings of God. He was learning about God. Once that heart got out of sorts, David got way out of character. And he began to do things and think in a way that he normally wouldn't think. And, and not only were things not right between him and the Lord, but he could tell. Nothing was right. Everything was messed up. You see, friend, there would be some people that they've never had a real honest walk with the Lord. They've never had a constant or a continuous faithful walk with the Lord. And they could be bachelor and not even miss it. But when you've been walking with the Lord for a while... And then one day out of the blue, you notice there's something wrong with your prayer life. And there's something cold every time you go to the book. or You're just not getting from the brethren. You're not feeling about the brethren like you once felt. You know, things are out of sorts. <laughs> David knew, hey, things aren't right with God. They're not right anywhere. Right. And he wants to get things right, and he did. He was returned and restored back to integrity. And the Lord testified to that, amen and blessed his life. And listen, David would still bear the consequences of that sinful choice he had made for years to come, but thank the Lord, he wouldn't have to bear those consequences without God. God would go with him. God would see him through all that mess. God would see him through all those trials. And God testified later to his reason he gave mercy to the kingdom of Judah, even after David had sinned. In 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 5, he said, Because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. And, and David lived and he reigned a good while after that terrible sin he'd committed, and God given testimony about it. He said, You know, it's just that one area. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't it be good if the Lord could look at your whole life and say, there's just that one time. I'd say He could say a lot more about me. But He said about David, He said, there's just that one area there. And He testified saying, He turned not aside from anything that He commanded Him all the days of His life. And from there on, God would reflect upon the reign of David and compare all those other kings of Judah to David. I mean, think about it. If they were a good king, he said they were like David. If they were a bad king, he said they weren't like David at all. And David was a standard that God held those other kings to measure up to. And here by this 
passage in 2 Samuel chapter 22, David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, he's got a song. He's got a song to sing. And this song also gets recorded for us in the book of Psalms as well. It's nearly identical to what we find here. And David at this point in his life, he's reflecting and he's looking back on his life. He's looking back on the relationship that he has with God and what God has meant to him all those years that have passed. And here he's near the end of his earthly race. At this point in his life, he's, he's no longer going to battle. But it's for a different reason than what he didn't go to battle for back in chapter 11. I mean, the Bible says, if you'll just look back one chapter, chapter 21, verse 15, it tells you why David had quit going to battle. It says in verse 15, chapter 21, it says, Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel, and David went down, and his servants went with him, and fought against the Philistines, and David waxed faint. And Ishbi Benab, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass and weight, he being girded with a new sword. See, that's not what you need. Yeah. Amen. Just stick with the old one. Yeah. He being girded with a new sword thought to have slain David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, secured him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. And so from there, other battles would come and go, and David, for the sake of morale and for the sake of the order of Israel, he would remain on the throne. And of course, in time, there would be peace. He was the great king over a great kingdom, Israel being undefeated while under his leadership. All this made for a long time for David to reflect on life. And he's reflecting on his blessings, and more importantly, he is reflecting upon the blesser. He's thinking about the Lord as God. And in that setting, David is moved to start to write. And he uh, basically, as I said, this psalm that he writes here, it shows up in two places in our Bible here and also Psalms 18. And he has by this time experienced most everything. Uh, he has accomplished a great deal. He has overcome tremendous threats against him. And he's escaped a ton of danger. And looking back, he sees the hand of God. And he does what's comely of him. He praises him. Amen. And he writes it all down so we can praise him too. Yeah. You know, David's God is worthy of praise and worship. Amen. And he is one that is worthy of our songs. Amen. Hey, when we sing, it's not just the official time. And that's what we do. It's just time to sing. Brethren, it's time to just, amen, put your heart into yeah, it. Amen. Realize what you're singing about. Amen. Realize who you're singing about, amen, and put your heart into it. Amen. We don't sing these old songs, these old hymns, because they're a good little tune. Amen. It's not for our entertainment. It's for our edification, amen. and it's for His glory. Amen. That's why we sing. And here David's singing, and he sings of the God who saves. Amen. He says there in verse 1, it says, and David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my rock. In Him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation my high tower and my refuge, my Savior, Thou savest me from violence. And David here, his song here is a song of praise, again as I said, for the God who saves. He knows this by personal experience. He is singing of a personal relationship. He knows this God. In verse 2 and 3, David uses the word my and me over and over again, somewhere around 10 times. He's singing about the relationship that he has with God and he lets everyone know it's personal. Again, he didn't just know about Him. He knew God. He didn't just live on what others told him about the Lord. He had a personal relationship with Him. He himself knew the Lord. And if you don't know what I'm talking about this morning, I'd sure investigate it. Amen. Listen, it may be neat and interesting to hear about Him, but nothing compares to knowing Him. Amen. And I'm talking, about, I'm talking about walking with Him. Talking with Him and letting Him talk to you and guide you and comfort you and encourage you. There's nothing like it. It's what makes life worth living. Amen. I kid you not. As I said, this is a song that's nearly identical to Psalms 18. There's just a few exceptions of a few words. As in Psalms 18, if you were to look over there, you don't have to. 
But it begins with these words. It says in Psalms 18.1, He said, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. And He adds those words, I will love thee, showing great affection. Showing His intended devotion towards God for the rest of His life. Amen. I think some of us, we understand the principle in the Bible, the truth of, of having two natures. And we understand, like Paul said, that in my flesh, there dwelleth no good thing. Amen. Listen, I want, I want you to know that that is a fact. Amen. That in our flesh, there dwells no good thing. And that old nature is just rotten and sinful as it ever was. It's not saved, won't be saved until Jesus comes. And right now, that old flesh is what it is. Yeah. Just always in the way. And if we're going to live for God and walk with God, we've got to learn to put it down and get it out of the way. Amen. And that's an everyday, all day long thing. Amen. And it's a problem for us, and it will be till the rapture. There's no doubt about that. But sometimes, friend, I think sometimes we, we give way too much credit to the thinking of the old man. Yeah. Since there are two natures, amen, the, the old nature is certainly not greater than the new nature. And the old man, he's got a way of talking and the new man's got a way of talking. And sometimes we say, well, I'm just being honest and really all we're doing is being honest after the old man. Somebody says, well, I don't read my Bible because I don't want to read my Bible. Well, that could be honest, amen, but that's old man honest. You know what, that new man, he wants to read the Bible. Someone says, well, uh, I don't go to church because I don't want to go to church. Yeah, that's the old man talking. The new man wants to go to church. The new man knows how important it is to go to church. The old man don't care about praying, but the new man sure does. And sometimes we think we're just being honest, and all we're doing is we're just giving credence to the old man's voice over the new man. We're not being new man honest. Listen, David, he wasn't afraid to say, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. He said, that's my intention. David also said in another psalm, I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He, he wasn't going to say, well, maybe I will, maybe I won't. I don't know. You know, there's that old nature. Yeah. He, amen. He made up his mind. Amen. He had no intentions of going through this life without God. Even when he himself dropped the ball, even when he took the wrong turn, he wasn't going to let that knock him out of the race. Yeah. Oh, but David, there's no offering that's designated to cover what you've done. He said, that's all right. God's rich in mercy. Yeah. And he just fell down before God and said, God, have mercy on me. And God, who is rich in mercy, showed him the riches of that mercy. Yeah. David said, there's nothing going to come between me and you ever again. He said, well, you just don't know that. Yeah. Yeah, I know that. But I don't have any intentions of living life without him. Amen. As far as I'm concerned, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. As far as I'm concerned, I will read this book. I need this book. I will talk to God. I will pray to God. I love to pray. Amen. I love to get a hold of the ear of God. I love to see Him answer my prayers. Listen, that's just new man honesty. And everything I said was a fact with my hand up. I love this book. I love to go to church. Amen. I love to witness to the lost. I love seeing people get saved. Amen. I love to give to the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. All that is a fact. Amen. No one put on. Yeah. That old man doesn't care about anything I just said. Right. Amen. Amen. But he's going to the grave. <laughs> this new man, this is the new creation. This is something God did by His grace. David said, this fellowship I've got with you is too sweet, too nurturing. I can't do without it. I'll love thee, Lord. I will love thee. You're my strength. Looking there at verse 1 and also considering the preface of Psalms 18, I realize that as David first sang this song, it was sang in the context of him being delivered from the hand of Saul a long time ago from the passage we're seeing in. But later he has to go back. And, amen. It doesn't just say just from the hand of Saul. It says from all his enemies. You know what he did? He backed up and took another run at this song. Man, there was a time there when he was delivered by Saul and he was so glad about it. He sang about it. But then, of course, in light of some other personal victories and personal deliverances, later on in this context, later on in life, we find this, this song appearing. It says, David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And so we find this song listed here in the context of 2 Samuel all these years later. We don't find it listed all the way back there when Saul was finally off the scene. And at first there, David probably had the thought that Saul was the challenge of his life. Amen. He thought, you know, there, 
And this guy's out to get me and God deliver me. And then one day God delivered him. And he was glad and he was grateful about that victory in that situation. But the fact is, by this point here, he's lived long enough to realize there's enemies to come. And there were other threats that followed after Saul. And looking here at David's psalm, reflecting back also on what he said in Psalms 18, I think it's plain to see, he was personally grateful that God was a foundation to him that would withstand all the storms of life. Not just a Saul, not just a enemy, but all of them. Not just a big storm, but all the storms. God's there through them all. David uses this expression of me and mine and I. And he does it so often. It's childlike devotion and love. My rock, my fortress, my deliverer, the God of my rock, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my high tower, my refuge, my Savior. Again, this is a song of personal relationship. You know, that will really make a difference in our singing. Those old hymns. Amen. Amen. When you just think about what you're singing about. Amen. You know Him. Sing about Him. Amen. Because He's worthy of it. Amen. It's comely. You know what that means? It's, it's becoming. It just suits us. It fits us. If we've experienced this salvation, we ought to sing about it. <laughs> He's worthy of our praise. Amen. That, that's only right. It's only Amen. becoming that we sing about Him. Listen, there's a big difference in someone singing how great thou art. Because they got a great voice. And they want to show it off. Then someone who knows about Amen. this great God. Amen. Amen. You can sense the difference when they sing. Amen. Listen, this is a song also about a powerful relationship. Not just personal, but it's powerful. Listen, you need to have your own relationship with the Lord. You need to understand what it will do for you. He says there again in verse 3, The God of my rock, and Him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. David here expresses how the Lord is his Savior, how the Lord is also his sanctuary. He's the place he runs to whenever he's in danger. He sings here of how the Lord God is his stability, his rock. Everything else is changing and moving and shifting and people change. Amen? Things change. Relationships change. But He never changes. He is the Lord from everlasting to everlasting. He's our shield. He's our safety. He's saying the Lord is all we need whenever we find ourselves in trouble. Amen. And when trouble came into David's life, he called on God and the Lord heard him. And the Lord delivered him. He said in verse 5, when the waves of death compassed me, when the floods of ungodly men made me afraid, the sorrows of hell compassed me about, the snares of death prevented me, in my distress I called upon the Lord and cried to my God, and He did hear my voice out of His temple, and my cry did enter into His ears. Reading the record of David's life, we see times when the gates of the cities of men were closed to him. We see times where he couldn't go home. We, we see where he couldn't go back to Jerusalem. We see where he wasn't even welcome at the worship side of the tabernacle. But even when there was no help with men and there was no help or assistance given from the place of worship, he knew God was there. That the throne room of God was still open to his cry there and he sang about it. He sang of the God who saves. And in the song he sings about a personal relationship and he sings about a powerful relationship and he sings about a profound relationship. We won't take time to read all the way from verse 8 through verse 20 there, but down through there, David goes into great detail, even prophecy. And it's amazing there about Christ being delivered later and also of the people of Israel uh, being delivered by Christ. Uh, that's a whole lot of what's in this psalm there. And in this historical setting though, David is getting a blessing of God's power to deliver him and God's faithfulness to him. And you think about here, God the Holy Spirit moving on David. Think about it in a historical setting to give a message of prophecy about future deliverance concerning the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and our victory through that and given prophecy concerning the rescue and the deliverance of the remnant of the house of Israel at the second advent of Jesus Christ and how God could give that message through David 
in a historical setting at the same time it was a message to David. And he was getting encouragement from it. He was getting some peace from it. It was a profound relationship. And you and I, we've got it recorded in our Bible where we can go back and we can read it for ourselves and get a message for us devotionally. That's some book you're holding there. I mean, a passage that will speak to Christ, speak to Israel in the tribulation period, speak to David historically, and speak to you and I at present. <laughs> That's a living book. This is a profound relationship. I mean, that Bible there, it's not out of date. <laughs> it don't need to be rewritten. It just needs to be reread. Amen. Get in there. God will give you guidance. Listen, David sings of the God who saves, and next he sings of the God who sustains. Amen. <laughs> He'll give you what you need to finish. Thank the Lord. Through these verses here, he shows how God is sustaining through times of temptation and times of testing and times of trial. He says there in verse 21, the Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands, hath He recompensed me. Notice, for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all His judgments were before me. And as for His statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also upright before Him and kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore the Lord hath recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in His eyesight. You notice here, as, as David's talking about God's blessing, he's saying, I, I found the track. I found the way of peace. I got on it because of the Word of God, because of the statutes of God, because of the precepts of God. Right. You know what he's not doing? He's not bringing up all that junk in his past. He's not confessing old sin that God's already forgiven him for. <laughs> God's moved on and so has David. Amen. Amen. Good. That, that's good to understand. I know a lot of days this is put, some people try to get this point across. They talk about, you know, well, what you need to do is you really need to forgive yourself. And again, that's just psycho babble. It doesn't mean anything. Nowhere in the Bible are you told you need to forgive yourself. What you do need to do is you need to have enough faith in God that He's forgiven you. Those aren't just words when it says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When somebody therefore takes their sin to God and they confess it to God, they can know He is faithful, Amen. He is just, He has forgiven them, and they don't have to keep digging it up and bringing it up over and over again. It's time to move on. Amen. Amen. You don't let that weigh you down the rest of your life. You go on. Amen. I heard the story of a boy that had killed a chicken there. It was a pet chicken. and He killed it there on their farm and he felt bad about it one day there. They knew he had done it. His parents did. And they kept watching him and kind of giving him, you know, the, the, the tense eye. And uh, he got feeling bad, you know, got under conviction, if you will. And he went and dug that chicken up and he brought it back. And he said, look what I've done, Dad, Mom, look what I've done. And they said, son, you shouldn't have done it. And now go bury it and forget about it. And he went and he buried it. He got to think about missing that chicken and playing with that chicken. You know what he did? He went and dug it up. He brought it back to his mom and dad. Mom and dad said, no, no, no. Leave it buried. <laughs> Leave it buried. Yeah, right. Amen. Thank God we don't have to keep digging up our past, digging up Amen. our mistakes, Amen. recalling all those sins. Listen, God's faithful to forget it all. Amen. Here David's talking about how God blessed him and got him on track, and he's not bringing up all that old stuff. Doesn't have to. He says down there, look at there, verse 26. He says, with the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. And with the upright, thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure. And with the froward, thou wilt show thyself unsavory. And the afflicted people, thou wilt save. But thine eyes are upon the haughty, that thou mayest bring them down. For thou art my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. For by thee I have run through a troop. By my God have I leaped over a wall. Listen, not only was God David's Savior, but He was a sustainer. God had given him His Word and David loved it. David loved the Word of God and he loved how it got him out of trouble and he loved how it kept him out of trouble when he sang about it. He said, Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. David had God's Word he had God's leadership, whether it was the Scriptures, the Urim, the Thummim that the priesthood wore, or the faithful prophets that came to preach to him the Word of God. He was sustained through it all. Sustained through loneliness. Sustained through being threatened. Whether it were 
attempts made against his life when he was in the palace. Uh, there were rumors imagined against him. Even family troubles. God sustained him through it all. One victory after another. And he sang about it. Third, David sings of the God who strengthens. God had protected him. He was saying about it. Verse 31, look at it. As, as for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He's a buckler to all them that trust in Him. For who is God save the Lord? And who is a rock save our God? God is my strength and power, and He maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hind's feet, and setteth me upon my high places. That's God's protection. Amen. I'm glad I've got it. Amen. Listen, when the breeze gets blowing in my life and the things get moving in my life and the things get to rumbling and I see the storm kicking up, I know where to run. Amen. <laughs> you better know where to run. Amen. I heard of a man named Danny Williams there in Florida when uh, Charlie hit the coast there and ruined 12,000 homes, something like that. I mean, that thing come in there and this guy, he had a favorite hiding place and is the old family tree. He went running out there to hide under it. And right at that moment, his family watched that tree fall over on top of him and kill him. He ran to the wrong refuge. That's what happens. Storms get brewing around in life and you go trying to find something with the arm of man or you try to find something in the religion of men. You'll find out it won't protect you during the storm. But now the Lord will protect you. He'll protect you. David showed how God protected him and how God prepared him. He says there in verse 35, He teacheth my hands to war, so that a bow of steel is broken by my arms. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy gentleness hath made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me, so that my feet did not slip. I mean, David proved to be very mighty in the heat of battle. And it was God that was with him every step there, preparing him for the next step. Amen. The steps, of the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he found out the track there to follow and God was in those precepts. And God protected him by them and prepared him by them and even promoted him. There, notice verse 38, it says, I have pursued mine enemies and destroyed them and turned not again until I had consumed them. And I have consumed them and wounded them that they could not rise. Yea, they are fallen under my feet. Thou hast girded me with strength to battle. Them that rose up against me hast thou subdued under me. Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies that I might destroy them that hate me. You know, he's singing about, he's singing about victory. They looked, but there was none to save, even unto the Lord, but he answered them not. Then did I beat them as small as the dust of the earth. I did stamp them as the mire of the street and did spread them abroad. Thou also hast delivered me from the strivings of my people. Thou hast kept me to be the head of the heathen. A people which I knew not shall serve me. Strangers shall submit themselves unto me. As soon as they hear, they shall be obedient unto me. Strangers shall fade away, and they shall be afraid out of their close places. The Lord liveth, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of the rock of my salvation. It is God that avengeth me, and that bringeth down the people under me, and that bringeth me forth from mine enemies. Thou also hast lifted me up, on high above them that rose up against me, thou hast delivered me from the violent man. Again, he's speaking of a promotion due to victory. And all this information, not only there for David, but prophetically it speaks of a great victory that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you just go back and read all those verses we just read, and just instead of seeing David saying all that, see that in the voice of Jesus Christ. Amen. And realize that that's where you put your anchor. Amen. You've attached yourself to Him. Amen. He's your foundation there. And there's a great victory that we have in Jesus Christ over sin, death, and hell. And it speaks of that great victory. Also, future speaks of the tribulation saints that are looking to the Lord and they're going to experience that. And again, we see devotionally personal daily victories that we go through in this life. The Lord rising up and helping us. The Lord standing up and becoming our shield. There's victory in Jesus, brethren. Amen. Amen. Not just in salvation, but from that point on, Amen. we have a good God. Amen. He is a rock. He is a high tower. When you're in trouble, He's the one to run to. Amen. Now, He's the God also who strengthens, sustains, saves, and secures. Verse 50 says, Therefore I will give thanks unto Thee, O Lord, among the heathen, 
And I will sing praises unto thy name. He is the tower of salvation for his king, and showeth mercy to his anointed unto David, and his seed forevermore. Amen. Amen. David there in verse 50 uses the word therefore. Therefore. Talking about security. It is a, it's a past arrangement. Amen. David's, David's looking ahead and he's looking backwards to look ahead. He's seeing the future by the, by the things God had already done for him. You understand? His security that he had at that moment was based on a past arrangement. That's where our security is. Amen. It's a past arrangement. Amen. I heard a brother say once, he said, listen, he said, I quit doubting my salvation the moment I realized that all I had was the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. And he said, at that moment I realized that if the blood of Jesus Christ can't get me to heaven and keep me out of hell, forget it. Yeah. He said, I'm not going. Amen. And he said, you know what? Nobody's going. Yeah. <laughs> Friend, listen, if the blood of Jesus Christ can't get us into heaven, we're not going. Amen. You know what that brother said? He said, so I just decided to quit worrying about it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Listen, you'll find sweet peace whenever you give up on you. <laughs> if you think you got a you got a hand in this, if you think you got a part in your salvation, you're always gonna worry about it. When you realize it's all on him. And neither is there salvation in any other. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. When you realize he alone is the Savior, you'll find sweet peace. You'll find assurance. You'll realize that security you've got. It's based on a past arrangement. Not only that, it's a present asset. Amen. Talking about therefore what he did, he said he is the tower of salvation for his king. It's a present asset. See, he is. Praise God for what he's done for you. Praise God for what he's doing for you right now. Amen. What a blessing. What a blessing. The present security. You and I have. We don't know in a day's time really what all we've escaped, what all God's kept us from. Yeah. Amen. We won't know till the judgment seat of Christ, really. Uh, I, I heard the story of Ira Sankey, who uh, was a song leader for Dwight L. Moody for years there. And one day he got up and he sang the song, Savior, like a shepherd lead us. And after the meeting there, a, a man come to him and he said, did you serve in the, in the Union Army, Mr. Sankey? And he said, I did. And he said in 1862, and he named the battle, he says, were, were you a picket? Were you on picket duty? And he said, I was. And he said, you know what? He said, I was a Confederate soldier. And he said, I watched you by moonlight. And he said, you were right in my sights, and I had you. And he said, and you reared back and you saved that song. Saved you like a shepherd. Amen. And he said, I couldn't bring myself to pull the trigger. <laughs> You never know. Amen. Amen. You just never know how the Lord's taking care of us at the present. Amen. Based on that past arrangement. And that provides a permanent assurance. He says, And showeth mercy to His anointed unto David and to His seed forevermore. He's looking down the road. And He says, I know the God I serve. And He's not going anywhere. Amen. I heard of two brothers that were being... Uh, given to the beast there in the Colosseum during the time of pagan Rome. And one said, brother said, he said, when we face the beast, will you be afraid? He said, listen. He said, I'll be greatly afraid. He said, but you know what? He, re he said, I realize the Lord's here with us. And he said, he said, I won't run. Not until he runs. <laughs> I won't run until he runs. Listen, friends, when you've got the assurance of the Lord's presence in your life, you'll stand up to anything. You'll make it through anything. You understand? As long as you've got Him, the rock, the God of your rock, your high tower, your Savior, your shepherd, you see, He is all that and more to us. This is coming from a man looking back on his life, reflecting on all the blessings, and he reflects on the blesser. Remembers God in the context of all that he's been through. And that's a heart after God. All those years later, he's still got a heart after God. He's still in love with his Lord. And I hope today, listen, if there's somebody here you've grown cold in your affections, your devotion, kind of get distracted by uh, the world, I hope today you'll realize who he is to you. And you'll get closer to him.
I want to ask you to stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We're going to go, Lord, in prayer. And brethren, you know you're in time of invitation. If the Lord deals with you, it is a time where you can draw nigh. But also I'll say this, if you're here and you've never been saved, you're invited to come meet Him by faith. He's at the right hand of the Father and the way to get to Him is, is nigh thee, even in your mouth, it's the word of faith. And if you'll call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. Call upon Jesus alone, who died for you, gave Himself for your sins, that He might deliver you from this present evil world. Call on Jesus Christ alone to be your Savior, and you'll know salvation. Believe on Him who died for you and rose again and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He's the only Savior. Father, I pray that You'll bless this time of invitation, help us all to take evaluation of our life, and Lord, assess the direction things are going in, what's important to us, what should be important to us. Lord, help us to be honest. And I pray, God, for the brethren here, Lord, help us all to, to be better than we came in. And Lord, I pray if there's someone here that's never been saved, I pray for their soul. Help them to understand the simplicity of the gospel. In Jesus' name we ask. With every head bowed, everyone praying. So if you want me to begin and play. We invite you to come to be saved so that we can have opportunity to address any question you might have to show you straight out of the Scripture what it says a man must do to be saved, to help you and assist you in the way of assurance, having a no-so salvation. So we invite you to come. But the truth is, you don't have to come. There's no salvation in that aisle. There's no salvation on this altar. There is salvation in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. After you've believed on Him and called on Him, if you've done it from the heart, you should want to confess Him. You should want to identify yourself with Him. You want to be numbered with Him. You want to be identified by Him. So you should confess Him. People should know if you've been saved. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. missed in prayer. I certainly appreciate everyone's faithfulness to come to church this morning and trust you'll make it back tonight for the evening service and be praying. Brother Ben Henson, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer, please, brother?